Hi, everyone, and welcome to Green Jacobs Lecture Series 2023. Uh, today, we have a wonderful speaker, an exciting lecture. It is the Jacob, Green Jacobs Lecture Toward More Equitable Housing. We are the Center for the Living City, and we are coming to you from Scranton, Pennsylvania, home of Jane Jacobs. And this lecture is being sponsored in conjunction with Mary Wood University School of Architecture and the AIA Northeastern Pennsylvania. So today we have Jacob Steimer with us who will be talking about justice through journalism toward more equitable housing. The way the lectures work are, I will introduce Jacob to you in just a moment. And we would invite you to follow along and put any questions that you have in the Q&A. And then Jacob's going to talk 45 minutes and then I'm going to disappear. Then I'll come back on and help answer some questions. So Jacob, thank you for being here. I'm going to just introduce the talk and you, and then I'm going to uh, let you get on your way. We're really excited about this one. So, Jacob Steimer writes about housing for the MLK 50, Justice Through Journalism. His marquee stories have highlighted Memphis's NIMBY problems, recent white flight, and how a Tennessee housing policy concentrates poverty and denies opportunity. Steimer and his wife, Caroline Ballman, have fallen in love with Memphis in their six years there. They are proud fans of the Grizzlies and denizens of a core city neighborhood. Jacob, welcome to the Center for the Living City and our Jane Jacobs Lecture Series. We are just so happy to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. I'm excited. See you in a little bit. Thank you. All right. I will go ahead and share my screen. And get this going. Okay. Um, so as Maria said, uh, I'm the housing reporter at MLK 50 Justice Through Journalism, uh, which means I spend my days visiting low-income apartment complexes, uh, interviewing local experts, watching eviction court, um, I received degrees in journalism and economics from the University of Missouri. So I, I come at housing from a kind of an ec economist bent, um, but also from a you know journalist in the field um, in low income neighborhoods, mostly um, on a daily basis. Um, obviously, I'm a white guy talking about equity. So I just want to point that out from the beginning. Um, I knew nothing about race uh, until my senior year at Mizzou. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, if anyone in the audience remembers um, the protests um, that got me thinking about race. Um, I still don't claim to be an expert on race, um, but I have worked hard in my current work to surround myself with Black authors, co-workers, neighbors, and church members uh, to inform my journalism. Uh, talking today about what I see uh, in my work as, as kind of the two largest issues that I try to focus on. Um, the great housing shortage and relentless segregation. Uh, I think if you read my work, uh, you can probably trace any story I write back to one of these two issues. Um, so let's start with the housing shortage. Many in the audience may already know this context. Uh, when the housing market crashed in 06, 07, you know, home developers went out of business, contractors found other jobs. Um, it became harder to get a loan to develop housing, build housing. Um, so we built far fewer homes for since then, <laughs> um, 15 years. Uh, and Demand continued to grow, um, growing population, growing economy. So supply demand, prices rose. Uh, and specifically in the last few years, they rose very quickly. Here's a chart 
uh, showing uh, housing start. So like the number of homes getting built just fell off a cliff in 06. And as you can see, it's come back, but there's this huge kind of lost amount built that that we're not making up for. Um, you know, we've just kind of made it back to kind of what maybe a level median for a year should probably be. Um, and so prices have spiked. Um, you know, it's no no shock to an economist. Uh, I've, I've pulled up Scranton because I know there's some Scranton people in the audience. It's basically the same story as the U.S. Uh, if we're looking at the house price index. Um, so, yeah, there's a huge housing shortage. What does this mean for real people? Um, you know, I see it every day, unfortunately. Um, between March 2020 and December of 2022, rental rates jumped 30% where I'm at. Um, so that left a lot of low-income Memphians really at the end of their rope. Um, Memphis is one of the poorest cities in America, if you don't know. And people were really used to being able to find somewhere to rent for $500, $600 a month. That might sound really cheap coming from some other cities, but just with the poverty here, like that's what prices kind of had leveled at. And now you can't, if you can't find anything for less than $800 a month, it was, it just really hit people hard. Um, everyone I talked to, in the in the nonprofit world is constantly hearing from people looking for housing it's shifted the whole ecosystem if you're um a landlord and you have housing it's way easier to evict someone now because you know that there's another five tenants that would come and lease the apartment from you um it's a true true crisis that we're seeing every day here in memphis and and i know from reading great journalism across the country that, you know, it's happening in New York City too. This is Susie Mitchell. Um, she's a really fun woman to get to know. Um, she's a great babysitter. She's got lots of toys around for her nieces and nephews. And just like I said, Susie and her mom were used to being able to pay $650 a month in rent. And when rent jumped to 735, they just couldn't pay it. It didn't work in their income. So, Susie ended up in a rooming house and her mom ended up sleeping on her sister's couch. So when we're talking about moving the title of this lecture, moving toward more equitable housing policy, I think number one, more equitable housing policy has to help us reduce the cost of housing. It has to help us get more housing built. Whatever ways we can find, we should be aggressively increasing quantity of housing. Perhaps the easiest way to do this, there's there's lots of ways, is is through simple upzoning. Um, I, as I talk to experts, you know, they they point to this as kind of a one of the cheapest ways, right? You don't have to put a billion dollars in your city budget for new affordable housing. There's already developers that want to build zero lot line subdivisions or apartment complexes or, or other forms of dense housing. And people want to live there. Um, so upzoning is, you know, maybe not always the right tool, but um, I, I think I've been convinced talking to experts through the years that it's maybe the simplest way. Um, and you know, there's beyond just a zoning process, on every step of a process, it seems like housing developers, especially low-income housing developers are fought and told they should build fewer units. Um, and obviously, look, developers are out to make a buck. I'm not trying to make them sound like saints, but they are people trying to build housing. And 
I think we should be supporting development as of as much housing as possible, all else being equal, um, and not kind of the status quo of of nimbyism that we see all across the country, uh, especially in at least locally. It's kind of especially in the suburbs. Um, so yeah, relentless segregation, other big problem. You know, Memphis is still a town of white and black neighborhoods, as are most U.S. cities. Um, got some stats here from the Othering and Belonging Institute out of Berkeley. They have a great map um, and some great studies on segregation and, and ongoing. Um, and you know, this is the stat that hits me every time is that, you know, Memphis schools are more segregated right now than they were 50 years ago. Memphis schools are more segregated right now than they were 50 years ago. Our neighborhoods are still so segregated. Uh, if you haven't checked out any racial dot maps, I would strongly encourage them. Uh, I tell all my friends that aren't even in the housing world at all. I think they're just so helpful for understanding cities um, and how they work and the ongoing disparities and the ongoing disinvestment um, and schools and so much else. If you just Google racial dot map, five will come up. Um, in so in these ones, uh, orange are black and blue is white, uh, and the pink is Hispanic. Um, so as you can see in Memphis, like there's this diagonal of white people um, that we call the Poplar Corridor, um, and then we're a majority minority city, so there's a lot of orange on the map. Um, and, you know, like before I got into writing about housing, I, you know, I thought about white flight as like a 60s and 70s thing. Um, completely wrong. <laughs> um, obviously, Tyree Nichols uh, news out of Memphis recently, y'all, I'm sure at least saw some of. So I went to his neighborhood because uh, it was the big national news and did some reporting and, and learned about the white flight that happened there in the 90s and 2000s. Um, I've spent some time in the neighborhood next to it that had similar white flight around that time. In both neighborhoods, there was about 80% white in 1990, and now they're at 5%. Um, and it's still happening. Like, there's still neighborhoods that are transitioning in this way. Like, white people in Memphis are still leaving, going farther out as Black middle class people move into their neighborhood. Um, citing the same old fears around schools and crime. And um, yeah, it's it's pretty insidious and pretty untalked about. Um, I find that segregation just doesn't get talked about much in Memphis. It's just assumed. Um, and white flight just doesn't get talked about much either, even though it it, white flight in the past has caused so many issues and white flight is still happening. Uh, this is Debbie Patterson. Um, she and her husband bought a home in one of these neighborhoods, not realizing that the white families were starting to leave. And, you know, her property value has taken hit because of that. Her favorite stores closed. Her city services declined. Um, white flight's not you know, something from the history book. You know, this is this is Debbie. You can talk to her. And it's um it hurts. It hurts, it hurts real people. Um I didn't include much, but you can do your own research. White flight has been encouraged by state and federal governments. Uh mortgage interest reduction, spending a ton on highways instead of public transport, um, and there's, you know, other ways. Uh, 
um, I think some people today are like, well, yes, the city is segregated, but like, why is that a bad thing? Um, you know, it's why, why can't, why is it so bad that black people live with black people and white, white people live with black, white people? And I, what I try to talk about is, you know, studies continually show that if you are low income, you have such greater chances in life, economically, educational wise, if you grow up in, in a middle income neighborhood than if you grow up in a low income neighborhood. Um, so in Memphis, you know, if you grew up in White Haven, which is a very black neighborhood, as a kid, now as an adult, you probably make about half of what someone who was also low income growing up, but just happened to be raised in a wealthy area now makes. I'm sorry, that was a little confusing the way I phrased that. But the, the way to think about this is connections, right? Our economy is based on connections and networking. It's who you know. I mean, we all know this. Like we, Most of us got our jobs based on who you know. And if you grow up in a place where the other kids' parents went to college or the other kids' parents have money, your social capital to be able to participate in this economy is just so much greater. So, you know, if we're going to get serious about addressing the wealth and income gaps um, between, you know, in Memphis, you know, still so many, so much of the wealth and income is divided white and black. And if we want to, if we want to really attack that, we have to address segregation. What can be done about this? It's hard. <laughs> um, in the history of this country, we have not been able to convince white parents to send their kids to school with low income black and brown kids. Um, it, I mean, busing, we've tried and then we stopped trying, um, even though studies show it works. Um, you know, studies show that it doesn't hurt kids from the highly educated white family to go to these schools, but, you know, trying to convince parents of that is again, it's just proved an impossible task. And, and I hope that's not true for the future of this country, but um, it's been the case for, I don't know, 100 years, more than 100 years. Um, but there are some things, you know, systemically, we can incentivize desegregation, we could, we could upzone white suburbs. Um, you know, that's, tough politically, but the Biden administration is trying right now with some carrots and sticks to kind of force if you're like if you're a really segregated white suburb to like come up with a policy to what's called affirmatively further fair housing. Um, you know, zoning really matters here because a lot of suburbs have really restrictive zoning laws that they put in place in the 70s to keep black people out. And they still achieve that because really strict zoning a lot of times means higher home prices, hard to find somewhere to rent if there's no apartments in town. And, you know, because Black people tend not to have as much wealth or income because of decades of reasoning there, um, it's, it's just hard. Uh, so upzoning one way. Low-income housing tax credits something I wrote thousands of words about. <laughs> you might not know what they are, but it's the primary way we as a country subsidize low-income housing. Um, and currently pretty much all low-income housing tax credits are made or are given away in low-income major minority-majority neighborhoods, which encourages segregation because only 28% of residents of LIHTC subsidized housing are white. So like we as a 
country are deciding, hey, where should we put the new block of housing for low income people? And we're saying still to this day in 2023, we're saying, let's put it in the black neighborhood. And so we put all, you know, it's just anyways, these decisions are made by individual states. Um, you know, in, in Tennessee, it's the Tennessee Housing Development Agency. Uh, some do better than others. Uh, the IRS is actually, because it controls these tax credits, it could step in if it chose. Um, but yeah. And, you know, I mean, you, if you are a white par parent, I mean, you can choose a diverse neighborhood and diverse schools. Um, you know, I was talking about at coffee this morning with someone from who's a who runs a community development corporation of a disinvested minority majority neighborhood. And we were talking about this, you know, it's the schools matter so much. And if if more parents from highly educated backgrounds had their kids there, if there was more social capital overlap happening, sharing happening by more people with social and monetary capital moving into these types of neighborhoods. Um, it's hard to think of a more impactful way one person can make a difference in a neighborhood. That's all I got. So uh, I think Maria is going to come back on and help me out. And I'm so sorry that that went so quickly. <laughs> oh, that was great. Thank you, Jacob. No, I just wanted you to stop sharing for a moment. I wanted to. I have some questions for you, and I know that some of the students here are just crafting some of the questions. Jacob, I don't see you anymore. Yeah, uh, it says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Let me see. That's to start video. How about I bring you back? How about that? There you are. Um, okay, so I have a question for you while I'm waiting for some of the other ones to start to queue up. The um, very interested in what led you to this career in housing and journalism. Jacob, oh, you're muted. Let me unmute you. Ask to unmute. There you go. Oh. Okay. There you go, Jacob. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, I went to the University of Missouri thinking I was going to be a sports writer as a lot of men getting into journalism do. Um, and quickly realized I did not want to be a sports writer and work <laughs> nights and weekends and was a nerd about economics and ended up getting a job at the Nashville Business Journal writing about um, like restaurants and real estate. Got a job at the Memphis Business Journal writing about commercial real estate, um, you know, trying to get the big scoop of the new development, trying to buy coffee and lunch for architects and uh, get them to tell me things they probably shouldn't tell me <laughs> so that I can be the first one to know mm -hmm. when a project's happening. Uh, and it was a fun beat uh, for four years. And then I got, started talking with the founder of MLK50 um, about her this news organization she had recently launched and it excited me to try to make a difference doing um, big impactful stories and the most natural way we could think of was was housing because I had a lot of knowledge about housing writing about commercial real estate writing about new apartment developments um, but had not had the chance to really dive into the big housing issues of our city especially facing our our kind of low-income residents. Um, and so I've been really excited to kind of dig into a bunch of stories uh, in the last couple of years. So um, can you tell me more about the MLK50 project, the whole 
I'm sorry, I don't know much more about yeah. it than I should. Tell, tell us. Yeah, so uh, MLK 50 Justice Through Journalism was founded um, almost six years ago uh -huh. uh, for the 50th anniversary of MLK's assassination in Memphis, hence the name. Right. Uh, it was also named that because it was intended as a one-year journalism project um, to help the city grapple with the anniversary of his assassination. Oh. Thankfully, donors and um, others saw value in Wendy's work and in um, journalism that challenges the status quo and um, you know represents the type of people that MLK came to Memphis to help um, that Wendy was able to keep it going for a while. Um, and then she also wrote some amazing investigations. Uh, she actually just dropped one today if people want to check out our site. Um, and through the power of those investigations was able to fundraise even more to bring on a staff. Mm -hmm. And they were growing really quickly. We just got a huge grant from Ford Foundation. Um, and are, are really excited to see what we as a as a nonprofit news organization in Memphis uh, can do um, to um, change our city. Yeah, through journalism, right? Could you yeah. could you tell could you give us the link to how do we check that out? She just wrote something to say what is it MLK? No, oh, Chelsea just put it into the chat, but it's MLK50.com. Thanks, Chelsea. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, there's a bunch of questions in the Q&A. I just started asking questions. I'll, I'll pick some. Okay. Um, Jacob, we have one from Christopher Salisbury. How often is the racial dot map updated? The one that you showed, was it recent or, or how do we find that online? I think most of them use the 2020 census data. And then, so the original was done at the University of Virginia, the, the most famous one. And it was okay. based on 2010 census data. I don't think it's any longer operating, but with the new 2020 census data, I've seen a lot of different um, people uh, create it. So yeah, it, it, it's a like once every 10 years. So it's not great for seeing how neighborhoods shift in real time. Right, um, right. I think Chelsea just put in the chat, uh, the, the othering and belonging uh, mm. link. Okay. That map is also on a, decennial schedule mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately um but it's still i don't know i still really enjoy if i'm ever going to a city um or trying to learn a, a new city um or even trying to learn a particular part of memphis and, mm -hmm. and what it's going to be like um because you know unfortunately race is such a good predictor in America of income, wealth, investment, you know, all these things. So we're thinking every, according to the census, it kind of follows that the dot, the map is updated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We have one from Alvaro Marino, who's a, I know, who's a architecture student here in Scranton. And he asks, you mentioned that white flight is often encouraged. So how? Yeah, so so what I was talking about is through the decades, um, federal, state, even local policies have subsidized white flight um, in that we keep spending the large chunk of our transportation budgets on interstate expansion projects. Right, right that make it easier for suburbanites to get downtown and make it easier for more people to move farther from the city um, as opposed to, you know, spending it on uh, transportation within the city. Um, the Now this isn't as big of a deal since the changes in tax code under Trump, but for a long time, a mortgage interest deduction was a huge part of ways of, of a person's taxes. That was a, hu a huge tax write-off 
for everyday middle class Americans was how much they spent on their mortgage. Mm-hmm. So spending more on your mortgage meant that you got a bigger tax write off, and so it encouraged it was a it was a huge subsidy for the suburban homeowner versus the urban renter to leave the city and go out to the suburbs and build a big house and yes. have a big mortgage and then get a better tax incentive. Yes. Uh, so there's lots of there's lots of ways that the suburbs have been subsidized Mm -hmm. um and so that was just a quick note i wanted to make is you know when we talk about potentially changing policies to make a more equitable housing landscape policies for decades have driven a less equitable housing landscape yep that makes sense Thank you. Oh, hey, another architecture student, Anna. What role does journalism and housing beats, what role do the housing beats have in the future of local housing policies and planning? So you as a journalism, how much do you affect policy and planning? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I don't necessarily see myself as like an advocate. for like some certain housing policy, but at the same time, I do, and it's kind of this line we walk at MLK 50, I am fully in favor of what I think and what experts tell me is best for, um, you know, the the least of these, for lack of a better term, um, you know, for the people that most need help. Um, and so, you know, in, I wrote um, kind of a first person piece about this a little while ago mm-hmm. that I think for a long time, the way journalists have covered development has um, probably been harmful. Um, you know, we go to these public meetings and there's the, the people protesting the development and there's the developer. Mm-hmm. And kind of the most natural thing we see as a journalist walking into the room is like, oh, here's this rich developer trying to make money. And here are these, you know, little Davids trying to, you know, stand up for their neighborhood. And um, even if we try to kind of, you know, we think of ourselves as a good journalist, unbiased, present both sides. I think a lot of coverage has really you know, been pro NIMBY for for a long time in journalism. And and kind of what I wrote about is I think we've kind of misidentified the David and the Goliath in that situation. I'm not I'm not saying the developers the David. Mm-hmm. Obviously they're gonna make money and are a Goliath, but but NIMBYs are kind of a Goliath too, in that they already own their home, you know, these studies on the people. Yes, thank you, Chelsea. Uh if you don't know, NIMBY. Now, not not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> someone who's protesting something getting built nearby right right um, a lot of times in my work that's an apartment complex getting built somewhere in their vicinity right and they don't admit because they think apartments bring crime studies don't really show that to be true but they think they think apartments bring crime or apartments are gonna overburden their school system or right, know, right. Just, honestly a lot of times it, it really does go back to race i i think unfortunately um you know, there's going to be a, you know, apartments mean black. And so I don't know that I want that near my neighborhood. Anyways, so I'm not saying the developers are the debate are the David, but I'm, right. I'm, I'm also not saying a NIMBY is, is a David. I think the true David is, is especially if we're talking about a low income apartment complex right, trying right. to build, mm-hmm. is, is the people that would live in this low income apartment complex. Um, or let's say it's even market rate, uh, you know, high right, right, right. type apartments. Studies show that that it, it really is supply and demand. So it, even if just building new supply of housing period mm-hmm. is going to open up apartments in older uh, right. apartment buildings. Established areas, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, for people that, that really need an apartment. Right, right, right. Um, and so anyways, I, I don't, I don't know, I've kind of gotten off on a tangent, but 
my hope is that in the, as we move forward, and I've seen this from other journalists across the country, mm-hmm. we we start as a as a as journalists to realize the housing crisis that our country is in, right, and grapple with that and what that means for for what needs done moving forward. So it's interesting because you know you talk about the the NIMBYs, the not in my backyards. We have the developers. Is there the is it, uh, people that are going to be are they lost in this conversation sometimes like the actual occupants of these yes yeah, so. like low income apartments that need it like are, do they have a voice in this and are you sometimes trying to like as a journalist how do you represent all of this as an unbiased objective observer and not try to you know say how you feel about it and that to me that seems like why well, I probably couldn't be an obs- uh, <laughs> a journalist because yeah. I would probably feel like I'd have to say how I felt about the situation I would yeah see, that is a challenge because you see you see it yeah one nice thing about being at MOK 50 as a as a startup that like tells right. you in your name we're like pro justice right right it's like we're okay with towing that line like uh-huh. I think any journalist would tell you there's not there's no such thing as like a truly unbiased article because journalists are humans and we're biased right and so we at MLK 50 kind of just embrace that more of like, okay, we are biased. We're still going to, I mean, we're not going to like tell it, break it down into like good guys and bad guys. And like, this should definitely happen. And, you know, right, like, right. like we're not going to become activists and, but, but it, I mean, it's a continuum. And, and so, yeah, I think as, as you say, I do think that that voice is missing of the person that would live in the apartment um, or the person like the Susie Mitchell that I showed in my slides of someone who who's being severely damaged by housing not getting built and price right. skyrocketing. And so I think it is in, in, um, a a burden that journalists should take on is somehow bringing that voice into the conversation, the people that are not going to be at the public meeting. Right, exactly. To have their voice heard. Because, I mean, these public meetings, like, the people that show up are largely old, white, rich. I mean, like, studies have been done on, like, who shows up to these meetings. And, um, yeah. yeah. Maybe the folks that need it, you know, are working, can't get there at the time, or, you know, have working two or three jobs, or whatever the situation is, they're not able to get there. And yeah, exactly. You know, it's yeah. because a lot of these meetings are during the day. Also, like if it's a town meeting for a suburb that currently doesn't have any apartments in it, like mm-hmm. the residents of that town are going to show up, not the people that would right. move it to the apartments. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, we often say Jane Jacobs was a journalist, you know, and she she saw these things and you know, how many years ago, and you you brought that up, you would think that at this point, these things weren't still happening, and they are in new in new and sort of more nuanced ways, but it's similar conversations that we're still, you know, dealing with. Memphis is really an interesting place to show, show it in a, um, a very deliberate what, I manner. You can see so much happening in Memphis regarding these issues. Yeah. Okay, let me get back to the question. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, I'm lost with you on this conversation. Um, Okay, let's see, Kyle. So how do you get folks to speak speak truthfully to you about real housing issues? So similar kind of vein, right? This is from Kyle, one of the architecture students here. What role does journalism and the housing beat have in the future of local housing? So I guess it's similar to, I guess when you interview people, Are they honest and truthful about the real issues that are happening? Is that a challenge for you? Yeah, I mean, it takes work to, I'm a big believer in door knocking. Um, Mm. Like, you know, you, I, I, I like going to low income apartment complexes. I like meeting people. Um, I like, I like going to neighborhoods I'm writing about. And meeting people I would have never met before. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, like, 
people people will talk to you about their housing situation. Um, they will. They'll talk to you. They'll, they'll be honest with you and just tell you. Yeah. They'll tell yeah. you if they think their landlord's awful or if they love their landlord. They'll tell you what they think about their neighborhood. It's pros. It's cons. That's great. Yeah, we weren't sure if that would be something that you would find a challenge to have the doors answered when you knock. You know, how hard is it for you to, to, to break into those areas and get those honest conversations? It's good to know that they're. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's see this one. This is from Josh Berman. It's a faculty member here. In terms of zoning, zoning as a tool for inclusive and exclusive planning practices, what are your thoughts on accessory dwelling units, ADUs? Yeah. As a way of combating combating affordable housing and costs of living to densify and diversify neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, I think ADUs are great um, as a, a tool that is, again, an easy tool. Like, yeah, I mean, let people put an Airbnb in their backyard or 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 an apartment. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I don't see downside to ADUs. The thing with ADUs is like, you know, here in Memphis, we've recently made it easier for people to mm -hmm. have ADUs. And uh, what I've been told, I don't think there's like massive uptake. Right. You know, it's a way to find an easy extra, I don't know, few hundred apartments for your city. Right, right. And I could be wrong. I, I haven't studied AD, ADUs ex extensively. If, if someone on this call has and, and wants to send me a study showing why it's a, a tool that can have huge impacts, then like, please do. I'll, I'd totally be interested in that. Um, but I guess my worry is like scale with ADUs and like having a, a big impact, I guess. That's fair. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so we have a lot of questions now. I need to get through a bunch of them. Um, this one I'm gonna try to read through. This is, a, this is from a gentleman, Tom Hanchett. Tom, I hope I'm saying that right. Might you go back to the Scranton graph for a moment? He writes, Scranton population has been going down over this period. I think the city would have this surplus of housing even without new construction. I've looked unscientifically at several cities from Youngstown where the population is plummeting to Charlotte where population is growing, while housing units have increased. In all of these places, real estate prices are going up. My conclusion, I'm suspicious of the shortage as a casual explanation for rising prices. So I guess what he's saying is, is there actually, you know, a shortage of people to gouge, price gouge? So how do we yeah. find that out? Um, so Memphis has not had a growing population either um, right. in decades. And um, the prices are going up? And the prices have skyrocketed. Right. So there's and, the, yeah. yeah, so there's a few things you have to think about here. A, you have an economy that's growing. Um, cross country, even in Memphis, people are making more money. As people have more money, they have a higher demand for housing. So that's one thing. Um, B, in Memphis, I know this to be true. I would assume in Scranton, we lose a lot of homes out the bottom every year. So homes that used to be lived in mm. and available for rent and are now boarded up, completely unlivable. Right. Um, you know, maybe even being demolished, uh, owned by like the local land bank or whatever. Right, right. Um, and so you need new housing to make up for that. Right, um, makes sense. You, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, this problem has been worse in cities that are growing in superstar cities, right? Like in Nashville and Austin, mm -hmm. you know, San Francisco, whatever. Housing affordable affordability is way worse because we see the same supply demand effect amplified by like booming demand. Right, right, yeah. 
in Memphis, it's more the supply. Like in those cities, like there is more getting built, just like not enough more. Right, right. Memphis, like we build so little housing every year. Mm -hmm. Um, Like it's, there's just a, so my guess would be Scranton. I mean, if Scranton's not growing population wise, which I believe you, I don't know much about Scranton and we're seeing that spike. I mean, I bet we've seen very few homes and apartments built in Scranton. And I think there's one thing that even local Memphians get wrong is like, they're like, well, but there's all these new apartments in downtown and midtown. It's like, well, yes, you know, as the millennials have moved in, there has been some stuff built to meet that demand. And maybe you're seeing this. Yep. Mm -hmm. Same. And we mistake that for a lot getting built in the metro area. When in reality, at least in Memphis, you know, the new 200 unit apartment complex in the cool part of town is getting built and we don't see the new 500 unit apartment complex in the suburb that we saw 10 or 20 years ago going up, you know, all the time. We've seen, I mean, we've just seen a big decline in like these big suburban apartment complexes getting built. Right. Um, And in like new subdivisions getting built in a lot of local suburbs. Um, And so I think that just because like, as you drive around like the core parts of Memphis, you like people see the new apartment complexes that do come up. Right, yeah. Um, It's a really easy miss to say like, oh, Memphis is building a lot of housing. When like, if you just like look at like the hard data, like we're not. Right, right. That's what I think Tom was asking that, yep. Um, Andrew has shared a national map with us in the chat, which is terrific. Thank you. I think there are some questions about school. So I want to try to, Nick Pfizer asks about how can public schooling be changed to be more equitable along with housing? And then there's another, I thought there was a question about schools. Um, Amy Goldenberg asks, is school funding, if school funding was equitable across school districts, that would take away the excuse that some neighborhoods have bad schools. So I guess maybe you could, if you have a minute to speak about the schools and how this all plays into this conversation. Yeah. Public, public schools. I would want to start by saying I am not an expert on schools. <laughs> um, I... I've researched schools, uh, you know, the stuff you saw in the slide deck in the way it relates to housing. Uh-huh. Um, I have, I do have a lot of thoughts about schools. I'm trying to think. One is, um, I think general perceptions about what schools are bad schools and good schools right. is largely wrong. Right. Um, And I think that it needs to be challenged. It is really hard, it is a really hard task to take someone from a family where that, you know, neither parent went to college, maybe neither parent graduated high school. um, And there's all these childhood traumas, um, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences gets talked about in education a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you you have, who, I mean, who knows what children in kind of the lowest income parts of Memphis where um, unfortunately the murder rate is way too high have seen yeah. when they're entering school. Yeah. Who knows if they're getting fed before they get to school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. who knows sleep anyways so all that to say school in low-income neighborhoods is really hard to do and I think we mistake poor test scores in some of these schools for for a bad school so school doing a bad job bad school yeah now that's not to say like there are no bad schools you know (laughs) there's you can do and, and so one thing I know Tennessee has tried to do is like grade schools based on like growth, like mm-hmm. how, how well do they move kids from a second grade reading level to a fifth grade reading level? Right. Like 
valuing that over like a school in a suburban district that moves kids from like a fourth grade to a fifth grade. Because right. um, obviously that's harder to move kids right, to right. see big growth. Um, and this is a long tangent, but I guess all that to say is like, there are bad schools or um, or schools that, you know, maybe you, you don't want to send a kid to because they're legitimately not educating kids well. Those exist. But I think what exists in probably greater number are schools that are working really hard to accomplish a really hard task. And I think that's why when we study kids from higher educational or higher income backgrounds that go mm -hmm. to lower income schools, we don't see those kids do poorly long term in education or or money that they make throughout their life is because these aren't bad schools like right right you and if 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 you are, as the parent at home are giving them you know this great educational background right. um and then they're going to a good school that's trying really hard just doesn't have the test scores as the right. like all white suburban school because of who they're working with, right, right. then yeah, of course it's not going to be bad for your kid. And right. yeah, you know, your kid's going to gain a lot of social skills, exactly. um, meeting people, you know, from diverse environments. Incredibly and, valuable, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, we need to improve schools in low income neighborhoods. And there's, I'm not an expert on how to do that. There's a million ways we need to do that. I, I think someone mentioned in the chat, like funding formulas. I'm not an expert on that. Yeah, but we need to better fund schools, improve right. schools, all of that. All of the above, yeah. But I don't think that it's fair to say that all these schools right now mm -hmm. are bad yeah. right. and not worth sending your kid to. Um. And it would improve these schools if they had more parents from highly educated backgrounds sending their kids there or, you know, improve these schools, right. at least in test scores. Yep. Um, it's kind of like white flight on a different level, almost the school level. Or at least with yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's and it's honestly and it what, it's what causes white flight a lot of the time is like, you know, you start getting more black and brown kids in a school like parents are going to get into uncomfortable whether or not they like to admit it. Um, they they want to go to the the lily white school in the suburb where the where the test scores are high. Um, okay. They think that's what's best for their kids. For their kids, yeah. And um, and obviously, no parent's going to do something they don't think is best for their kid. I'm just what I try to push people toward a little bit is 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 it actually what's right. best for your kid? And you know, I, it's not a battle I expect to win very often. Um, <laughs> just based on the history of this country. But, you know, if you want to read Nicole Hannah-Jones's work on this, um, you know, prior to writing a lot about like history and the 1619 Project and, and all that, which I know is very controversial in certain circles, she was an excellent education reporter. Really? Um, That's amazing. Yeah. And, and what I still consider to be her best work um, has been done on on American education and, and it has important right. a lot of, of, of what the way I see that. So I would, I could not recommend more reading Nicole Hannah Jones. Thank you. Well, someone said you didn't understand a lot or know a lot about the schools. I think you gave us a great, <laughs> a great retrospective, a lot to think about <laughs> with that. Yeah. Um, you know, we're almost out of time. Let me see if I could find, um, this one, I'm going to just, we're, we're, we're interested in retrofit housing here in Granton. So I'm going to ask this one. This is from Alex Liddell, one of our uh, fifth-year architecture students. And hopefully you can hit this one and then we'll try to wrap it up. How can we use minimally invasive retrofits to single-family homes to create multifamily buildings without detracting from the idea of a suburb? So I guess, does that make sense to you? So, how, so we're interested in retrofitting housing here, minimally invasive. Do you have experience with that in Memphis where they're converting? Um, I haven't heard of the multifamily buildings. I haven't heard of that happening much. Um, turning a single family home into like a duplex, I guess, or a quadruplex, or a maybe if it's yeah. big enough. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I guess my same worry would be scale there. Like, yeah, it could be a great thing to do in like, right, right. like you know, if you're a, a small developer looking for a project, but, um, but like, you know, is that really going to be something that provides your city with thousands of new apartments? Like not, and you're, I guess you're taking off some single family homes, which, you know, the goal would be to add single family homes and apartments. Right, right, right. I'm, I'm not trying to force people into living in apartments. I, I, it's where I see a I think more demand right now, uh -huh. but, you know, yeah. Good. Okay. So, I mean, in three minutes, see if you can answer this question. <laughs> this actually comes from our very own Chelsea, which I love this question. And she wrote it if we had time. So, and I'm very interested in this as well. We all are. Jacob, what story have you covered that has affected you the most? And has any of them sparked you to become an activist? Would you become one? Should you become one? So this is a tough one to answer, and now we have three minutes, so. So what have you been, what, I mean, I know you mentioned earlier before we went on Zoom, some of the people that you're working, a story you're working on long-term right now with a woman. But, in a, yeah. yeah, so I don't know. What do you think? Has affected me the most. Um, man, that's. I feel like I'm going to just give a really bad answer to this. Um, no, no bad answer. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, like in kind of the starting point of like, these are the two big problems that I gave at the start of my slide deck. Right. Um, the housing shortage one, like, I think I, I, I would have gotten there just as like being an economist and like, reading other housing journalists and reading housing economists. The segregation one, I really came to through um, some reporting when I was at the Business Journal. Um, sorry, so before I was at MLK 50, I was at the Memphis Business Journal writing about real estate. During the, around the 50th anniversary of MLK's assassination, um, and it just, I think that's around the time where I really, you know, digging into the data on like the segregation that, because back as writing for the business journal, I'm not going to like visit people at their apartment complex, but I am going to look at data, mm -hmm. um, and like real estate trends. All right. You know, that's what I did for a living. And, and just seeing in the data, you know, the segregation that still exists in the city right. um, 50 years after the assassination of Martin Luther King, um, yeah. you know, is, is, I guess, to use Chelsea's phrase, like what, what kind of so radicalized me or, or pushed me to be an activist in, in some way, um, even though, you know, I'm still not an activist. I... <laughs> You know, my wife and I bought a home mm -hmm. intentionally in a majority minority working class neighborhood. Um, and um, which again, I don't know, maybe I would have done otherwise just because of kind of the circle I run in, but is, um, yeah, I think segregation is just a really big deal that people don't talk about. Like it's, I mean, MLK talked about it all the time. Mm -hmm. And as, you know, um, I don't know. I think we're kind of close. It, it makes more sense to us today to kind of latch on to some of MLK's deals around, um, ideals around like mm -hmm. the economic divide, uh, you know, fair labor. Right, yeah. Fair pay. Right. Um, or just like the dignity of, of human life and, you know, there's lots of ideals of MLKs that we do latch onto, but uh, it seems like we've really stopped talking about segregation um, yeah, yeah. much as a society. And I think it's a huge deal. Well, you're going to keep talking about it and writing about it and bringing it to our attention. And thank you for that. Thank you for, for what you do for all, to all of you and MLK, the MLK project and for your empathy and your care to these very, very, very important topics.
Jacob, we're just so happy to have gotten to know you. And uh, from all of us at the Center for the Living City, we're just so grateful for what you do. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, for, you, this, so thank you for this talk. Thank you. Um, we're at five. So we will stay in touch and we'll look at, we're going to follow these links that you sent to us and we're going to follow your work and, and you do the same. Yeah. Stay and touch and feel free to reach out to me, jacob.steimer at mlk50.com. Um, or like, I try to make myself feel, I think you can find my cell phone on the internet, but you know, just like reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about these issues. I'm a total nerd about these issues. So. <laughs> thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Jacob, thank you. Thanks. Bye.